Uh, we will start with this uh, web seminar, web, web um, presentation. So objective of this uh, presentation is introduce biofilm for you to understand what is a biofilm, what are the impact and first you know what is a biofilm. After that, we will present some tools for detection and treatment. And we will finish with two industrial cases in order for you to understand what can be the impact and what can be the situation when you have, when you face a biofilm contamination. The objective obviously is to make you aware about biofilms in industries, but also in, uh, in catering and um, food facilities and uh, consequences on quality and, and safety of the final product. First, let's start with the definition, root cause and symptoms of, of a biofilm contamination. First, what is a biofilm? A biofilm is composed of microorganisms that can be present in a food process or in a restaurant and things like that. They are present in a, in, in a surface and it's microorganisms inside a protective matrix. This protective matrix is, is composed of organic polymers what we call the EPS for extracellular polymeric substance. It can be proteins as well, it can be DNA, lipids. So it's, it's a mixture of different ingredients that are inside this protective matrix. And that's why it's very difficult to act and eradicate and, and dissolve this matrix because uh, it's not accessible thanks to standard uh, product. It can be acid, it can be alkaline, it can be uh, oxidizers, sanitizer, it will not be effective on, on the biofilm. If you see the video here, there are, uh, this is the, the biofilm development in the labs, in lab, uh, lab scale. And you can see that it's a, a few bacteria at first that grow in, very quickly in a few hours. You can see that this biofilm is, is growing and is now widespread here on, on, this, uh, on this video. So it, it's not, it, it don't take one week, it don't take one month, one year for a biofilm to develop in a, in a facility. It takes a few hours. So it says that after a few minutes, after a few hours, you have those germs that are under the protective layer. It's well known that or is estimated that 80% of the microbial biomass on our planet is organized into a biofilm. And it's obvious because those germs want to protect themselves against mechanical, thermical, or chemical aggression. So it's not, uh, it's, it's very widespread in the, in the microbial biomass. Inside the biofilm, it's important to know that they are microorganisms are from one to 1,000 more resistant to biocide or sanitation. Reason is because they are under stress and in the stress mode, those germs will be more resistant. And also because the biofilm and the protective matrix will protect microorganisms, they are not accessible. So that's why you have to load a, a quite huge amount of, micro, uh, of biocide to be able to eradicate or to try to eradicate the biofilm. And it's not always possible to load 1,000 more uh, concentrated biocide in the food or in, the, um, in catering. It's known that 60% of the foodborne illness are caused or linked with biofilm. If a microorganism, and it can be a pathogen, it can be a spoilage bacteria, if this germs is found in an environment, there is 70% of risk of these germs to be present in the final product. Now let's talk about the biofilm growth cycle. It always starts with a planktonic cell. So it, 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 it means it's a free cell, a free microorganism that is present in the environment. You are not working in a sterile condition, so it's not possible to avoid any germs to enter in the, in, in, in the process. So first those germs will try to attach and fix themselves on, on the surface. It can be stainless steel, it can be plastic, it can be uh, glass, any surface. 
bacteria will try to fix on the surface. And after that, the role of this germ is to develop, multiplicate, and develop this EPS matrix. So it's a growing phase. At that time, biofilm are not visible because they are not releasing anything from the biofilm contamination into the finished product. Maturing phase, it means that the biofilm is going to develop and at that time, at that stage, it will be a three-dimensional structure with some canal for feeding the biofilm and also evacuating residues um, from, from the biofilm itself. Last phase will be the spreading. It means that biofilm, the microorganisms inside this uh, biofilm will talk each other, talk to, to, to the other germs. And they will say, okay, we are too many here. We have to disseminate. We have to release some fragment of biofilm or some planktonic cells. And this, that's why you have some spreading. It means that this biofilm will release some fragment or planktonic cells and we start again the fixing phase in another location. So it's a very dynamic structure and that is including different kinds and different types of germs and microorganisms. Which microorganism can be found in a, in a biofilm? So you have those, uh, this is a, a list, it's not all the germs, but it's a few germs that are well known in, uh, to be biofilm formers. Listeria, Bacillus, Staphylococcus, those germs are well known to be biofilm formers. Conobacter, etc. And it's not only microorganisms, but it's, it's not only, sorry, bacteria, but it can be also yeast and molds. Candida, for example, is known to be a biofilm former as well. Inside that biofilm structure, there will be some other germs or other microorganisms that are not producing biofilm. It can be the case of for viruses, it can be the case for phages, it can be the case for yeast and molds, and also some other bacteria that are not biofilm formers, but they will be happy to live in this environment that is a protective environment. There are many scientific studies about biofilms. So a lot of, uh, lot of uh, university and research center are working on the biofilm because it's, it's a topic that is well known and uh, a lot of uh, students or workers there are, are publishing many, many scientific studies. I will take uh, a few minutes here on, the, on, on, two, uh, on two studies. And that one is saying that if you have a biofilm, that is that has been developed or that is developed on the on the surface. It can be open surface or it can be closed circuit. If you apply a huge quantity of biocide sanitizer, in in, in this case it's uh, IPO. If you if you apply IPO, and you, you see that it can be 200 ppm, 500 ppm, or 1000 ppm of active chlorine. You can see that you are not eradicating the initial load, the initial biofilm contamination quantity. So stage uh, on the left, you have initial quantity and on the right, you have, if you apply 1000 1, ppm of active chlorine for uh, 20 minutes uh, contact time, you see that you are not eradicating biofilm. And it's not always possible to apply even 1,000 ppm of active chlorine on, for, uh, on the surface for 20 minutes. This, this study is also saying that if you apply 10 ppm of free chlorine uh, on planktonic cells, means those germs that are not in a protective layer, you will kill them. So you have to understand that if you have a biofilm, you have a risk of sanitation that will not be fully effective. Second one is uh, what we call the VBNC state. So viable, but not cultivable state of a bacteria. And in this case, it's a pathogen bacteria. So inside the biofilm, bacteria will be, because of the huge density of microorganisms, they will be under stress. They will be on the stress mode. And if you take those germs and you try to confirm contamination, if you have a contact plate, for example, they will not grow because they need and they require some specific condition to grow again. It means that, for example, uh, they need longer time or they need a very 
rich growth media or they need some specific conditions like temperature to develop again. And if you take those germs from the biofilm in your food facility and you put them in the contact plate, you, won't, you will not see them. So you, you, you have the feeling that you have no contamination, but that's not true. You have some live cells that are waiting for a good condition to grow again. So that's quite important. And it's known that 10% of the bacteria uh, are cultivable. So it means that the others, 90%, will not be visible. That's why it's important to integrate some other techniques that I will present after in this presentation. So many, many, many scientific studies are present to explain that ammoniums are not fully effective on, on biofilm. Uh, they are talking about gram plus, gram uh, germs, those specific germs that are, can be resistant. So many, many, many scientific studies on this. Now let's review together some symptoms of potential biofilm contamination in food facilities, but also in a uh, catering uh, application or food facilities, yes. Foodborne illness. So if you, have, if you are facing some foodborne illness, maybe it can, be it can be linked to a biofilm contamination. I'm not saying that all foodborne illness are linked to biofilm, but it can be a reason to have some foodborne illness in your uh, premises. Defective batches, so from time to time you have some batches that are not complying with your guidelines regarding uh, micro, uh, micro load or it can be regarding uh, organoleptic uh, properties, etc. Shelf, shelf life reduction, so if you are transferring germs from equipment to finished product, you, the load will be higher and if those germs are Spoilage bacteria, it will reduce shelf life of your finished product. Product recall, so you have some, unfortunately you have some, you're facing some contamination and you have to recall your product. This can be also a symptoms of a, a biofilm present in the food facility. Instable microtrends, if the microtrends show some peaks of contamination from time to time and you cannot link those peaks of contamination with an uh, incident, for example, in the production or a defective batch of uh, raw materials, it can be, the reason can be a biofilm present in the, in the equipment. Non-conformity, same. Production capacity reduction, in some cases, in, or, or in some specific equipments like membrane filtration, like heat exchanger, uh, and other specific equipments, you can have some capacity, reduction of capacity of production. Of flavors, of notes, organoleptic issues, those are symptoms of biofilm contamination. Positive stress test, if you place your product at the, at the end of the production in bad condition to see if the product is reacting and you see that there is an impact, it can be linked with germs that are present in the product and that are, should not be present. Market returns and complaints, it's also a very interesting topic here because uh, sometimes your control or quality control do not show any, any issue on the finished product. But when the product goes to the market in different condition, temp or time, it can be, the, the, the product can change and can be defective product. And there you will have some complaints from the market. So in some cases, if you are not capable to, to show biofilm contamination in your quality process, Maybe market returns or complaints will uh, give you some interesting information. Finish good losses. So if you are losing a lot of uh, quantity of, uh, of product and metagenetics. So if you are doing some or metagenetic or micro uh, testings on your finished product and you see that some germs are predominant compared to the, ad, uh, to the other ones, it says that one germ is taking the place and one germ is in a good condition to grow. And this can be also a, a link or a symptoms of uh, biofilm contamination. So adverse effect on biofilm, that's obviously sanitary risk, economic losses, reduction of in quality or uh, in quality of your final products, productivity reduction as well. So bacteria resistance to sanitizers and surface corrosion because biofilm is capable to aggress even stainless steel. So these are the adverse effects of biofilm. 
So if you are okay now, we will, uh, we will give you some questions. So it will be a, a small questionnaire where you can answer some questions just for, for us to understand if you are facing some, some issues. So three questions here. First is, did your company already face a contamination issue? Did you solve this issue internally or via a partner? And uh, was the contamination eradicated finally? So if you see uh, the questionnaire, it can be uh, interesting. Oh yeah, I see some, some, some answers, so it, it works. So let's wait uh, one minute for that. I'm happy to see that you have no massive issue, so <laughs> that's good for you. But some have some issues or only some contamination issue. So it looks like you are able to manage that internally. And 50% of the people man are eradicated by a film, so it's not always fully effective. Okay, so biofilm looks to be a, an issue for some of you. And uh, you need some assistance because you are not always able to manage yourself. And it's not fully effective. So I hope this uh, presentation will help you to have a deeper understanding about what you can do. Okay, let's continue. So, source of contamination, those germs, they can come from different origin. It can be your people, it can be, uh, it can be equipment, it can be the flow of material, it can be process itself, it can be utilities like water, gas, it can be material. So, many, many reasons to have some germs that are entering into the uh, production uh, facilities or into the equipment. And here you have some picture of the biofilm contamination. On the top, on the right, it's uh, it's a heat exchanger, plate heat exchanger. You can see this is a, in this case microscopic uh, biofilm contamination. Second one is uh, membrane filtration. Here I, it's in the dairy process, but it's it can be the same uh, if you have some uh, reverse osmosis equipment on uh, for. Uh, to guarantee the quality of the water that is used for a process, for cleaning, or for can be also inside the ingredient of your uh, finished product. And the last picture is um, uh, the picture of, the, of a biofilm itself. So you see it's a three-dimensional structure and uh, you have some, some feed canals in order to, to feed the biofilm and also extract uh, wastes and uh, residues. Now let's talk about biofilm detection and localization. In this chart, you see the different uh, way to detect, characterize, treat, and monitor biofilm. It can be uh, open surface or it can be closed, CIP uh, conditions. Regarding detection for biofilm activity, uh, we have selected the ATP second generation uh, tools because it's a very interesting tool that is an instant tool for us to show that there is a contamination or there is an amount of uh, microorganisms that are present in a, in a surface or in a samples we collect. So it means that thanks to, thanks to the biofilm detection kit, for example, I will show you after how it works, but thanks to this localization tool, we can, we can swap one surface or we can take a sample of uh, a liquid and via the ATP second generation that is 1000 more sensitive to standard ATP and also that is focused on those on ATP coming from germs itself. So we are not checking the free ATP. We are just checking the cellular ATP from microorganisms. We can see and we can, we can, we can prove that there is a huge amount of germs showing that there is a, an issue with 
cleaning and sanitation. Regarding localization of our open surface, we have the biofilm detection kit. I will explain just after. And we also have the slime bar test. This slime bar test is a, it's a specific growth media that allows germs that are producing biofilm to develop. And if they are developing in this specific growth media, they, they will be visible. They, they, they will generate a turbidity that can be checked easily after seven days of incubation. So this technique takes six, seven days incubation. Metagenetic for characteriz characterization. So it means that thanks to metagenetic, we will analyze the full uh, spectrum of germs that are, that are present in the in samples we collect from a surface or from uh, a liquid. Thanks to that, we can say that, okay, look, the flora has some very specific germs that are well known to be biofilm formers first. And also we have that germ that is very important regarding uh, ratio compared to the others. Seeing that, okay, that germ is well, well present and that germ is, is, is a biofilm former. So it can help us to understand if we are facing a biofilm situation if this biofilm is including some uh, spoilage bacteria or some, in some case, we can also highlight some, some uh, pathogen. So yeah, thanks to that specific uh, metagenetic analyze, we can analyze all germs that are present in one sample. Regarding treatment, you see that we have some curative treatment to eradicate biofilm and some preventive treatment for biofilm prevention. And those solutions are different for open surface and closed circuit. Regarding monitoring, uh, based on the, on the audit and based on the analyze, we can recommend you the, the more appropriate germs to follow in order to see if biofilm is re-entering or is developing again into the, the equipment. A few uh, a few information about the biofilm detection kit. So this is a very interesting kit that has been designed and developed by Realco in order to show and to confirm and locate biofilm contamination. So you have uh, two reactive, reactive one and two, and we have a scale of uh, intensity of blue coloration. You can see that uh, on the top, uh, on the right and on the top of the of this slide, you can see the scale, and you can see two parts: diagnosis one and diagnosis two. The diagnosis one is performed with the blue dyeing solution. It means that we will, after cleaning and sanitation, on the dry surface, we will apply this first uh, spray. We will spray this blue coloration. And if this blue coloration attach on surface, so it means that if we apply a rinsing a face and if blue stays on surface, it says that there is something. There is something that can be organic residue, what we call the tenacious organic residue because they are resisting to uh, alkaline acid sanitizer. So the process was formed before applying the blue. And if we still have some residues, they, are, they can be tenacious organic residues or biofilm. And to make the difference between biofilm or organic residues, we will use the second reactive, reactive two, and this is the second step, so diagnostic two. And there, if blue stays on surface, it says that it's a biofilm. It's not organic residues, it's biofilm. So in a 10 minutes time, we can, we can assess and evaluate and locate presence of biofilm on an open surface. And you can see here some picture. It can be uh, yeah, stainless steel. It can be here it's in the chicken industry or it can be the last one is a conveyor belt in the cheese industry. So it can be applied in a different uh, application. Biofilm eradication and prevention. So at Rialco we have developed and designed a, an enzymatic way to eradicate biofilm. You can see on the left uh, the chemical action of uh, oxidizer, acid, alkaline cleaners. And you can see that biofilm before and after treatment is still red spots that are biofilm, uh, microorganisms, sorry. 
and the wires is the protective matrix. So you can see that you still have a biofilm layer after the cleaning and sanitation process. On the right side, you see that enzymes will deeply act into the protective layer to eradicate and dissolve the matrix. And after that, when we remove this cleaning uh, solution treatment and we apply a sanitizer, that sanitizer will be effective and will be focused on planktonic cells that are still attached on the surface, but they are ready and free of access. That's important to understand that it's a two-step process. First, we apply enzymatic treatment, we rinse, and we sanitize just after. And that sanitizer will be selected and uh, will be selected depending on the type of germs that uh, customer is facing. So a two-step process. So why setting up a preventive treatment? If you remember the three step, the four steps, sorry, of the biofilm development, you have adhesion and you finish with the spreading. So it means that before spreading, you have no impact on quality. So it's not, there is no visible impact of the biofilm in uh, your uh, production area. So the blue uh, region, so it's high potential contamination area, is only when you have some four, step four uh, contamination uh, level. So if we are in that situation, if we are in a crisis, we will recommend to apply a curative treatment, is the red line on the, the bottom of the, of the slide. The red line is a curative treatment. And after that, we will follow contamination based on one specific uh, criteria or it can be germs, it can be organoleptic properties, it can be different, uh, different criteria that we will follow in order to see if biofilm is growing again in your food facility or in the catering industry. And when we will reach this maximum level that we will allow, we have to apply, we will apply a preventive treatment. So, Two situation, if you are in a crisis, we start with a curative treatment, or if there is no crisis, we can start with the preventive treatment and follow this uh, specific criteria to see and confirm that we are in uh, secure mode. So we are in the biofilm free uh, program. Solution for that, so here it's open surface. We have some forming products for, um, curative and preventive treatment. And we have some non-forming product for closed circuit for curative and preventive. So just for you to, you have to, you have, you have to understand that those products are not cleaners. They are biofilm treatment based on enzymes. So it's very specific enzymes dedicated, dedicated for biofilm eradication. Now let's review together two studies, two case studies. First one will be in the food industry and second one will be in the, uh, food, uh, in the catering uh, food facilities. First one, so here it's a beverage company, a massive one, uh, international one that was facing some uh, presence of microscopic residues that were not present at the end of the process that were not present in the stress test that they were performing on the finished product, but were present in the product when that product was staying for a few weeks in, uh, in the shops or in the, in the customer location. So they, they, they could not understand what happens because quality was okay. Quality was saying there is nothing. We can release batches so we can sell the product to the market. But after a few days, they, they get some complaints and uh, complaints from the market saying, okay, look, there is some macroscopic residues in my uh, bottle of beverage. And, uh, it's not supposed to be the case, so we have an issue. They understood and uh, they analyzed. They analyzed, obviously, those residues and they, they understand that there was a, a germ that was present in, the, in, in, in this beverage. And this germ is well, well, well known to be present in the beverage industry and is well known as well to be a biofilm formers. So, they ask us to come on site and to investigate and try to locate uh, the biofilm contamination in the process. 
You can see here on the chart that we have the contamination uh, thanks to ATP second generation. We have contamination levels and we have the, the different part of the equipment that we have analyzed. So in this case, it was possible to, uh, to separate the full line into 16 different loops. And from one to 16, you have the different loops analysis or the, the water analysis. And uh, 17 is the process water reference. So it's the, the amount of germ in the process water. And you can see that values here, it's the T1. So it means it's the samples we collect after one hour circulation of the enzymatic solution. And if you compare the number 17, so the quality of the water, to the quality of the water after one hour circulation, you can see that on loop 9, 10, 8 and 13, but so 9 and 10, we can see that there is an increase of contamination by four locks. It means that it's four locks increase contamination if you let circulate uh, the enzymatic solution into the equipment. So that's clear that in this full process, two equipment are critical regarding contamination. So we confirm a biofilm contamination on those two equipments. And just for information, one was the uh, sterilizer, so it was a UHT process. So based on that, we eradicate the biofilm on those two equipments. We explain to the customer that they have to have a strong focus on those two equipments. They have to uh, investigate why there is an issue. And also we recommend uh, the implementation of a preventive treatment. Uh, in this case, it's once a month, uh, they apply a preventive treatment and they get rid of biofilm contamination and this issue never happens. Uh, uh, never happens again. So back to uh, quality control, back to no, no more uh, product recall, no more complaints from the market, so situation safe. Second one is uh, kitchen, uh, professional kitchen. That company called us because they were facing some peaks of contamination. It was not crisis, but it was loss of control, loss of uh, capacity to manage hygiene. And they ask us to make an investigation in one uh, specific uh, workplace. It was the vegetable uh, workplace. And uh, we analyzed thanks to the blue dyeing kits or the biofilm detection kit. And you here you have the level of uh, intensity of, of uh, blue coloration after the process. And you can see that we have uh, level six, level five, level seven so it's too high and for us level seven uh, is uh, critical level four five is acceptable but pay attention and you can see that we have some we have three three points that were not okay so we confirm uh, biofin uh, issue and we apply the, the process risk eradicate biofilm and after that uh, preventive program in this case is the apply uh, preventive biofilm treatment once a month and you can see that situation six months after is quite different because we have level one two three in most of the case so it says that it's under control for us level one two three and level four, level four uh, for the work, play, work table number two it means that this is uh, tension we have to we have to understand or we have to uh, to reinforce uh, cleaning and sanitation. But most of the cases are under control. So this was a totally different situation uh, before and after the uh, prevention, biofilm prevention program. Conclusion of this presentation. And first, I will give you the opportunity to ask some questions. So you just have to use the chat box and uh, ask some questions about everything you want me to explain if is the case. So I leave you the opportunity to ask some question. Okay, first one. Are your product natural organic or synthesized? So all products are a blend of different enzymes coming from uh, fermentation. So we ferment some germs, they produce enzymes, and we will purify those enzymes and we select different kinds of enzymes that are active to, uh, to eradicate biofilm. So it's 
as I said, it's not cleaning enzymes. It's not enzymes for cleaning. It's enzyme for specific biofilm eradication. And the rest of the composition is uh, some uh, surfactant. And at Rialco, we are trained to use some green, uh, green surfactant. And uh, that means that our products are um, easy to, to destruct thanks to uh, uh, our bio-based products. So it's very green products. I hope it, it, it uh, answers your question. Or should care, how can we ensure no enzyme stresses? Okay, that's clear. So that's obviously uh, an important question. So uh, we have designed um, a specific tool. It's a, it's a strip that shows the presence of active enzymes. So it was, in, it was important for us to, to make the difference between active enzymes and non-active enzymes because the risk is based on those active enzymes and we want to confirm that they are not present in the, in the, in the final rinsing model, for example. So we, we have that tool that detects active enzymes and also we can use some uh, detection of proteins because uh, enzymes are proteins and on the market you can find some very sensitive tools to detect proteins on surface or on uh, final rinsing water. So this is the way for us to confirm that we are, we are not, there, there is no remaining active enzymes or enzymes in the system at the end of the process. So the curative treatment is just used for one time at the beginning, correct. So that's, that's clear. If you are facing a crisis, you will apply at the f for the first time, the only first time, you will apply the curative treatment. And after that, if you apply prevention, preventive treatment, at least once a year, you do not have to apply again the curative treatment. But if you don't apply the, the, the preventive treatment after one or two years, if you have a new contamination, you will have to restart with the curative treatment. So preventive treatment is just can be applied on young biofilm or uh, low biofilm. If you have a crisis or if you have deep impact on the, on the quality, you have to start with curative treatment. Could molds develop inside biofilm? Yes, inside the biofilm, you have different microorganisms. It can be yeast molds, it can be virus, it can be spores, it can be uh, unicellular, uh, the different different kinds of uh, microorganisms are present. And for example, in, for the virus, if the virus have inside the biofilm the specific germs they need to develop themselves, they will be quite happy to, to develop inside the biofilm. What type of green surfactant? Uh, I will not share with you the, uh, the formula of our product, but it's a uh, surfactant. Uh, that are coming from the, not the petrochemical chemistry, but from the uh, vegetal uh, chemistry, so the green chemistry. Is it necessary to maintain 45 degree temp at open surface in case of enzyphob? Oh yeah, so I, I see that it's an enzymatic user already, so great. Uh, our recommendation is to start. Uh, when, when you are using enzymes, is to start at minimum 35 degrees C, 3.5. Main reason is to, in order to reactivate enzymes, we need to at, obtain that level. Obviously, if you are in the slaughter, slaughter industry, for example, or uh, chicken abattoir, it will not be 35 degrees C uh, ambient temp, so it will be lower than that. But what is important is to reactivate enzymes and our recommendation is to use 35 degrees C. After it's not, it's not an issue. Whether there may be any problem. Question here is about dairy, dairy application and milk, uh, milk, uh, pasteurized milk. Yeah, clear. Pasteurizer, for example, is a heat plate ease exchanger, and it's often the case that we find biofilm development in those plate ease exchanger because they are quite difficult to clean because you have a lot of uh, areas that are not quite accessible. So, clear in the milk process, we can have some uh, biofilm issue. 
And also what is important to understand is if you have a heat treatment, so it means that heat treatment will be effective to reduce planktonic cells. But if you have heat treatment that is facing some biofilm fragment, it means bacteria inside the protective layer, that heat treatment, and it can be pasteurizer, but it can be also sterilizer, it will not be fully effective, or it will be less effective. And you will have some default, or you have some germs that are still present after the heat treatment, and this can be a massive issue. So what you have to understand is, before the sterilizer, so it means before the aseptic zone, you have to avoid any biofilm to grow because they can pass through the, um, the process and the treatment process. All can virus and mold is living biofilm matrix owned by the bacteria. Can they form a biofilm structure like bacteria? Who can virus and mold? So in, inside the biofilm matrix, it's not one single germs or one single species. Uh, microorganism. It will be a different bacteria living together. Bacteria, yeast, molds, all together, they will be very happy to live together and they will, they will exchange some messages together. So they will also, it's well known that inside the biofilm, you can have some gene transfer for some bacteria to acquire resistance to antibiotics. And this is made inside the biofilm matrix. So biofilm is not only in food industry or in the catering industry. It's also in medical application and in whole entire life. In the hospital, you have a lot of biofilm. And it has been confirmed that it can be inside that biofilm that you have a transfer gene of gene, sorry, and microorganisms will acquire some new specificities because they are combining their DNA and capacities. So yeah, biofilm is always a different species, Bacteria and different microorganisms are very happy to live together. Do the enzymes also work against algae or only bacteria? So algae are a bit different regarding the, the metric that, has, uh, that is produced by, uh, by bacteria. Uh, we have a selected, uh, we, we are selecting currently some enzymes that are active on algae. So we have some cases where you can see some limitation of uh, uh, our current, current product to be fully active on algae. So today our solutions are quite effective on all kinds of germs. Algae is quite a, a, a bit different. And also when we have some algae, it's often the case that it's more uh, microscopic, uh, microscopic uh, biofilm and uh, it's more in the pipes, water pipes, where, where they are not clean or not so often clean. So it's also a, a, a tricky, tricky issue. But we have some positive uh, cases with algae contamination, but I will make some, yes, I will not say it's always effective. Algae is a bit different. Can the can be used to pharma industry? Yes, yeah, sure. So we, we, are, uh, we are active also in the pharma industry and uh, we are uh, complying with regu regulation and recommendation regarding validation of cleaning, regarding toxicity. So yes, this is also uh, uh, an application where we are very active and uh, we, have some, uh, we have some validation to demonstrate that there is no risk linked to toxicity or presence of residues uh, using the worst case scenario, etc., etc. So we can help you also in this uh, cleaning validation uh, to confirm that you are uh, still producing in the perfect, uh, perfect way. All coliforms. So, so far we have no, uh, no germs that are not, sorry, so the question is, does it work with all coliforms? Uh, so far, we have no uh, residues that are not, uh, we have no residues that are not active against, uh, or that are not resistant to our solutions. So, and we are uh, already at the third generation of our, our mix and our R&D is constantly working on detecting some new enzymes that are more effective, that are more covering, that are more, uh, they are quickly acting on the biofilm layer to confirm that we are 
active on all germs. So, so far we have no, uh, no resistance of any biofilm. And I will say that it's, not, it's never the case that you have a one single strain biofilm in the food industry or in the catering. It's always a blend of different bacteria producing different kinds of biofilm. So it's always a mixture. And the goal of our enzymatic solution is to make some holes in the biofilm and after that, give the capacity of the sanitizer to deeply act inside the biofilm and remove and release and disinfect and sanitize all, all areas. What, what should be done to avoid problems of, from biofilm in the UHT milk processing plant? In the UHT, so in the UHT, it's not because you have a UHT equipment that you are fully assured uh, that you are you will not have any biofilm or germs that are present in the milk. So we have to analyze the process. If you, have, if you are facing some issue, we have to analyze the, 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 the full process, aseptic part, non-aseptic part, UHD equipment, to see if there is some biofilm that has, that, that has the capacity to develop into this, this process. And at the end of the day, if we have analyze the full process and we confirm that there is no biofilm contamination. Okay, it's not a biofilm contamination that is impacting the quality of the finished product. It can be ingredients, it can be water, it can be other things, but we have the capacity and UHT equipment process can be, and we, we saw that in the past, can be uh, contaminated by biofilm. Regarding times, it's still okay. Yeah, we still have time, so we continue. <laughs> Enzymes will decompose EPS into soluble organic matter. What is the final product of enzymes written on EPS matrix? So the question is, what is the goal of enzymes? So yes, enzymes will degrade and dissolve the EPS matrix by, it's like a parasizer, it will cut some uh, chemical link into the biofilm in order to give the capacity of surfactant to transport and evacuate this fragment of biofilm into the wastewater. So depending on the ingredient of the biofilm, it can be DNA, it can be proteins, it can be fatty residues, so bacteria are producing a lot of residues. Those one will be collected from the biofilm, extract from the surface and transferred to the drains and to the wastewater treatment plant. So uh, yeah, those enzymes, the goal of those enzymes is to cut into small, small pieces, uh, biofilm adherent uh, on surface. If we don't have eating system, are, are the barium enzymatic cleaning still effective? If we don't have eating system. Okay, so our minimum uh, recommendation is 35 degrees C Celsius. So it means that below 35 degrees C Celsius, some of our enzymes that are present in the, in the mix will be less effective. So because we want to guarantee a fully effective solution, we ask you, we ask customer to guarantee at minimum 35 degrees C. If you are below 35 degrees C, and I know that some companies in the market are uh, promoting uh, low temp activity, you have to select specific enzymes that are as active at low temp. It exists, it's not an issue but they will be less effective against all kinds of biofilm that are present in the food facility. So it means that you have a less, uh, the spectrum of uh, activity is less uh, broad. So you have some germs that will not be treated by low temp uh, enzymatic activity. If during the biofilm treatment, is it necessary to reinforce the infection? Okay, so Pablo asks us if it's important to increase sanitation process after biofilm treatment. Yes, it's important to have a adapted disinfection step after biofilm treatment because we are releasing a, a huge amount of bacteria. So because biofilm contamination is a very huge density of germs. So it means that quantity of germs that will be extracted and released by the biofilm is quite important. That's why at Hialco, we recommend to double uh, standard concentration ratio. For example, if it's 500 ppm to have a standard sanitation, we will ask you 
to raise 100 ppm and be sure that during the full process, 20, 20 or 30 minute time, for example, we still have 1,000 uh, 1, ppm of active ingredient. That's quite important, first. Secondly, depending on the germs, if we have some Bacillus cereus that are well known to be uh, spore former, we will ask you to reach the level of sporicide. So to guarantee a sporicide activity against spores that are present in the biofilm. So effective sanitation and maybe adapted sanitation on the germs you are facing. Because Mycobacterium, for example, is very strong. We need to raise or to load a bit more uh, level in order to guarantee fully effective sanitation. Are your product against spores? Are your product required temperature to activate the chemical? Yeah. So regarding the uh, question is, what is the required temperature? So yes, we need 35 degrees C, as I mentioned before. First, and our product will not be effective against spores. The goal of enzymes is not to kill spores and bacteria. The goal of enzymes is to eradicate, dissolve the protective matrix, and after that, the sanitizer, the biocide, will be effective against spores and bacteria. That's why at Rialco, we recommend to use paracetic acid, chlorine, or uh, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, for example, there are other uh, molecules, but we, we, we prefer to use a, a large spectrum molecule in order to guarantee that we are acting on all kinds of bacteria. In the water treatment plan for some equipments, ion exchanger, we can raise the pH which is suggested is okay. So in some condition, we cannot apply pH. Uh, the process is we start with pH 7 for the enzymatic treatment and after that we raise pH 9.5. If for some reason it's not possible to raise pH up to 9.5, the majority of the, the efficacy, efficacy of the treatment is done at pH 7. So if we cannot raise pH because of equipment uh, guidelines, we can do the treatment at neutral pH. So no aggression for the equipment at neutral pH, no aggression because of the, so the pH, because of the temperature, Etc. So we can we can have a safe safe process as well. Can we sure? Can we make sure that the curative treatment can eliminate one of the biofilm structure? Okay, interesting question. Uh, at top scale, we have developed a lot of very resistant biofilm uh, structure, and we have we have uh, confirmed that forty five minutes is fully effective to eradicate a macroscopic biofilm layer. In the food facility or in the catering industry, you are not supposed to have a macroscopic biofilm layer. It's supposed to be a very lower uh, biofilm uh, layer. We recommend two hours treatment. So one hour at pH 7, one hour at pH 9.5. So it's two hours. 45 minutes is fu fully effective. So. After two hours, we are fully sure that we have eradicated biofilm. But the only way to ensure that we are uh, fully effective is to apply again a second biofilm treatment and see if we can again extract some bacteria. We've done that when we have validated our process. So we apply a first biofilm treatment, rinsing, applying a second biofilm treatment, and we confirm that two hours treatment is quite enough to eradicate all biofilms. This is the only methods we have because it's not possible to investigate, investigate all part of a closed system, for example. On open, open surface, we can apply again the biofilm detection kit, yeah, the blue, and see if we were at level seven and now we are at level one. This is a, a proof of biofilm eradication. But in closed system, it's not the same style. Do you provide any portable instrument to, uh, or procedure to identify biofilm from regular microbiological tests? No, we are not uh, providing uh, equipment for biofilm control, but we are working with some partners that are providing ATP, uh, ATP meters or specific one I mentioned before, or we can also uh, recommend you the 
the, the slime bar test that is a biofilm growth media, specific biofilm growth media. So if you want more information, uh, you, can, you can ask us. We'll provide all information about what we have. But we are not uh, providing those equipments. We will refer to the sales rep from uh, the location you, where, where you are. What is the maximum temp to be considered in order to not inactivate enzymes? Okay, good question. So enzymes are proteins, so they are sensitive to pH and temperature. In the, in the biofilm range, so for biofilm removal, uh, the maximum allowed temp is uh, 62 very maximum. So we recommend not to exceed uh, 58, so 5 F degree C. If you are higher than uh, 60, you are inactivating enzymes. And unfortunately, it's a non-reversible uh, reaction. So it means that higher than 60, you are killing those enzymes. So it means you have to correct the temp. And after that, you can reload new enzymes to guarantee the full efficacy of the treatment. Okay, the time is, wow, a lot of questions, that's great. <laughs> are your products available globally? Yeah. So we are, uh, we are selling our products globally uh, directly or via some partners. So uh, yes, feel, feel free to ask us uh, what, is the, what is the process in your location. How do you confirm if stainless steel surface corrosion is biofin based or non biofin based? Interesting uh, question. And uh, first time I get that one. <laughs> so, um, we cannot confirm that it's a biofilm-based uh, corrosion. It can be because of the water itself. And uh, for example, in the pharma industry, we just start um, a collaboration with a company that is active in the uh, rouging uh, impacts of the stainless steel because it can be, the reason can be the, the water itself that can be aggressive. And uh, you have the degradation of the, of the stainless, stainless steel itself. So, but there is a link between uh, stainless steel aggression thanks to water and biofilm because both can aggress uh, stainless steel. And if you have an aggressed stainless steel, it creates some cracks and cave for biofilm to develop. So it's not good to have an, an aggress, uh, aggressed stainless steel because uh, rugosity will be different and it's a good, uh, good environment for biofilm to develop. So there is a, a real a combination of, of both. But I cannot say if, if there is a, if there is a stainless steel aggression. We cannot say if it's coming from, uh, from biofilm or uh, aggression from of the water. When do you expect biofilm to be planting cells in order to be protected? When do we expect biofilm to spread planktonic cells? So if I understand well, the question is, when biofilm is going to reach step four, when there is a spreading? It's not possible to, to, to determine when the biofilm will be ready to spread. That's not possible. Unfortunately, it's depending on too many conditions. Uh, it's depending, for example, if you are in the dairy industry or in the water industry, the load of microorganisms will be different. Uh, if you are applying a seven-step process, cleaning, uh, pre-cleaning, cleaning, sanitation, treatment, uh, sanitizer with different chemical or with hot water or with steam. So process, cleaning process and sanitation process will impact obviously also the, the capacity of biofilm to reach uh, the release of uh, some part and fragment of the biofilm. So we cannot predict. We can just check the, the releases thanks to the detection method or we can estimate uh, based on our uh, expertise uh, or similar cases we have faced before, we can estimate uh, the, the good frequency to implement the prevention uh, frequency. Is there any chance of biofilm growth to, in, in dry processing like spike? Yeah, uh, in dry condition, biofilm will not develop or they, they, they will wait for good conditions. But we know that spice 
uh, spices and also uh, grains uh, can 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 contain some some germs spores in the dormant states, waiting for a good condition to grow again. So uh, it's not because you are in dry environment that you are not uh, loading some biofilm or germs that are that have the capacity to develop some biofilm, but they will develop after in the next step of the process. What kind of surface are more stable to develop biofilm? Stainless steel, rubber, Teflon, glass? Okay, so uh, glass, glass is uh, a quite perfect surface, uh, hygienic surface, stainless steel as well. But in some case, you have some cracks. In some case, you have some, uh, some caves in the stainless steel. So biofilm will be able to, to develop. It's, uh, it's known also, there are many scientific studies saying that Yes, you have some capacity of, of treatment of surface to, uh, to limit biofilm or microorganisms attachment. And this is step one. But if you have some residues on those, if you have a not fully effective cleaning, you have some residues, it will be a perfect area, uh, location for biofilm to, uh, microorganisms to attach and develop after that in, into a biofilm. So stainless steel and high quality stainless steel and even uh, some, in some cases you have some uh, surface treatment to give some capacity, anti-microbial uh, capacity of the stainless steel, for example. This is going to reduce capacity of biofilm to adhere and develop into a micro, sorry, this will reduce capacity of microorganisms to adhere and develop into a biofilm. But maybe those very high quality surface is not the majority of the process and the equipment surfaces. So if you have good areas, okay, it will be less. Uh, the risk will be not located in those good surfaces, but you must have some other areas where you have some pumps, some valves, some uh, heat exchanger, some uh, pasteurizer, that will be a good place for biofilm to grow and pollute the, 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 the food process. But yes, there are some, the surface is impacting the capacity of germs to develop into biofilm. Okay, I think it's time to, to leave and to, to, to go to the conclusion, take, up, take home messages. So biofilm is everywhere in the process, so I will not tell you that it's only on some specific areas. It can be aseptic zone, it can be non aseptic zone, it can be woods, it can be workplace, it can be many, many reasons you have, a, many, many locations to have a biofilm. And depending on the, the environment, uh, depending on the, ta the, the, the temperature, for example, you will select some different gems. And uh, in a evaporator, for example, it will be some very specific gems there in the vegetable room workplace, it will, it will be different. Cause quality and safety issues. So you have some spoilers, you have some pathogen, you have some non-altering bacteria as well. So you can have, based on the type of germs that you have in the biofilm, you can have some quality and safety issues. Biofilm are not detected and not treated or destroyed within conventional methods conventional cleaning methods, but also conventional detection methods. It's important for you to understand that. But you can deal if you apply a specific monitoring plan based on, uh, on metagenetic, based on specific growth media, based on specific uh, contact plates uh, that are not TPC, but are specific contact plates based on the analyze we've done with the biofilm and we confirm that, that uh, for example, a specific germ is present, so it's good to follow that germ. So specific monitoring plan that will be additional to routine monitor, monitoring plan. Specific detection method, I've mentioned uh, uh, the biofilm detection kit, but also UV light, because also the audit can be, can be a specific method, detection method. And you can deal by implementing preventive uh, enzymatic treatment in order to avoid biofilm to, to grow and to develop into a, a risk in your food facility. Just a few information about who we are. So Realco is a Belgium company. We develop, produce and commercialize cleaning solution with enzymes. 
We have partners all around the world that are able to provide our product and also our expertise. Uh, Halco was born in 1968, so we are uh, in the hygiene since uh, many years. Our objective is to master hygiene uh, and propose and sell you some solution uh, to manage hygiene and go to the decontamination. So we want you to avoid any risk linked to uh, hygiene or germs development. And our technology goes international, so we are uh, present in the, in the globe. Globally, thanks to our partners, our team, Thank you very much. I hope you you learned something today. Recently, uh, we had to do that webinar thanks to uh, connected via your laptop. So we would like to to travel again uh, in order to give you some uh, live presentation and also have the capacity to to discuss uh, with our customer and partners. I hope it's coming soon. Uh, take care, all of you. Uh, in this uh, specific situation. Take care, enjoy, and uh, do not hesitate to ask us any question if you want. We are uh, available for, for that, that's obvious, obviously. Thank you very much. It was nice to, to talk to you, and uh, I hope to hear you soon. Bye-bye.